All right, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikiniak or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present. Voices presents speakers on timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out and return the surveys you received when you came in to a committee member at the back of the auditorium. These help to inform our future programming. Today, Voices presents Dr. Jennifer Thompson Burns. Jennifer is an HVCC alumnae and lecturer who received her PhD in history from SUNY Albany. Her dissertation, Black Trojans, the Free Black Community's Grassroots Abolition Campaign in Troy, New York, before 1861, was the 2018-2019 recipient of the Distinguished Doctoral Dissertation Award. Jennifer is a frequent lecturer in the Troy community, and today we are honored to have her with us. Please welcome Dr. Jennifer Thompson Burns. Super fast. How is everybody today? So I'd like to begin right, by introducing you to how I ended up picking this topic as what I researched and then wrote about for my dissertation. And I am a local girl. I grew up in Lansingburg. I ended up going to Lansingburg High School. Um, I ended up from there coming here. And as I was growing up in Lansingburg, um, I was one of very few African Americans in my school, in my class, and in the high school. And I had always wondered what the black people there were doing, kind of before the Civil War, right? And we did a lot of American history, and a funty, funny thing about me is that in fifth grade, I was failing history. <laughs> and so I had to do after school, right? Tutorials every week in history. Um, and I realize now, looking back, that part of it was because I wasn't fully connecting with different things in history which prompted that question even more as to where were all the black people, people who look like me in this area. Um, and long story short, much later, it became this dissertation. I sort of stepped into it in a way where I thought I could write a little article. And then the more I was going, I was like, oh, this is much bigger and there's much more there. And this is something I think everybody um, who studies black history and the history of abolition, but also local history here in Troy should know. And so that's what ended up making it into the dissertation. And so first I'd like to start with the idea, right, and the reality that before 1827 in New York State, slavery was legal. Right? And we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at abolition in the city of Troy, because the Afri African American community in Troy never got to be larger than just over 1,000 people in 1860. So they were substantially smaller as a community size than the black communities in Philadelphia or New York City, or in any of those other locations that historians typically write about when they talk about black abolition before the Civil War, right? So just a few numbers to get us started, right? In 1810, the federal census here for Rensselaer County had 750 enslaved people in Rensselaer County and 362 free black people. Right? And the way emancipation worked in New York State was that the first policy to ban slavery in the state was issued in 1799, and it was gradual. So men and women who were born enslaved would then earn or be granted their freedom when they turned either 20 or so or 25, females first and then males later. The legislature went back to the drawing board, and then in 1817, they passed a futuristic emancipation statewide. That would not happen for another decade until 1827. So in those 20 years, you had free people of color living in Rensselaer County and in Troy, but then some of them and some of their family members were still enslaved during that period. Right? So after 1827 is when everyone who was African American became free if they were formerly enslaved in New York, but also in Rensselaer County. Right? So now, I wanted to put this up to remind us that this transition Right, really took some time, and there were two major things that occurred during this 20-year period before 1827. The first is that in Rensselaer County, slave owners held on to their slaves longer than the owners did in Albany or Schenectady or in other areas and counties. 
Right? And I think part of that was largely due to Troy becoming the seat of the community or, or of the county, but also, if you can see with my little pointer, all of this hinterland here, right, was really farmland, and they were shipping into the county seat, which is Troy, the produce and the goods that were grown there. And then from Troy, there were ferries and then later steamboats and things and the Erie Canal that helped ship these goods. So they really held on to slavery longer because they were using their slaves not only to grow some of these goods, but then also as teamsters and things to bring it into the city. And we know that African Americans were also working on ships as seamen and also on the docks and the wharfs and fixing ships and things. Now this here is to give us a better understanding of this activity because we're familiar with Martin Van Buren from this area, right? Gets involved in state politics and then federal politics. He's, you know, this great guy, right? His family, of course, was, were slave owners. Right? And in 1824, so three years before state emancipation, right, one of the slaves that he owned had run away. And a man reached out to Martin Van Buren offering to capture that man for him, right, a rendition, to bring him back. His name was Tom, or in quotes he has him as Tom. And Martin Van Buren says, yes, of course, bring him back, and I'll pay you $50 as long as you bring him back without violence. Right? So all the way up until 1827, right, all of these men and women who owned slaves in Rensselaer County were determined to keep them. Right? The other thing that happened during this period, before 1827, is that the state legislature went back to the drawing board about suffrage laws. Right? And what they did in the early 1820s is redesign them. And so that meant that they opened up suffrage, as African Americans called it, the political highway, right, for people who had a freehold of $250 if you were African American. Other men prior to that point right, had to have a freehold as well, but they took that policy out of play for them. So after 1826, really, it was designed that for African American men that were free, they still had to qualify to vote with a $250 freehold, whereas white men did not. And this became even more complicated because the federal government was in charge of the policy for naturalization. And we know in Troy that there was large immigration into the city, the Irish and German and people from Canada and places like that. And so the naturalization process, according to the federal government, was that after a person has residency in a location for two years, they then could vote, right? And so this meant for many of the immigrants that moved into this community, they then were able to vote while native-born African-Americans who were free men had to qualify and in many cases could not qualify then to vote. And so this was something that African Americans in Troy became very dedicated to eliminating and challenging for civil rights, but also for voting rights and equality. Right? And so just so we have some more numbers, right? by the time we get to 1860, the black population in Troy itself right, is about 611 people. Right? So this is very, very small. Right? In New York City at the time, there were 12,500 people, African Americans. In Philadelphia, there's 15,000 African Americans. And the city of Troy was actually the sixth most populated city in the state. Right? So this is a very small community. They make up no more than 1% at the maximum before the Civil War of the population in the city. Now what I've chosen to do is to show you how I was able to do a lot of this research and gather it, because many of the people, African Americans in Troy, did not leave a lot of handwritten records. Right? But what they did do was use the newspapers for everything. Right? And in 1827, Samuel Cornish and John Rushman, they found a, the first African American newspaper, Freedman's Journal. Right? And through that magazine or newspaper at the time, and then other magazines that are dedicated to abolition and black writers, Trojans go crazy. They are constantly writing letters. They're constantly submitting all of their activities into all of these black newspapers. They are fundraising for the newspapers, and they are publishing their minutes from all these meetings they start to hold really right after 1827 when the emancipation happens in New York State. And so this one here is from 1836, and this is when, you can see at the top, the color people of Troy, right, 
hold a mass community meeting. And what they do at this meeting is give their pledge that they are going to become members and found a local chapter or auxiliary of the American Anti-Slavery Society. The American Anti-Slavery Society had been founded three years earlier in Philadelphia, and there were African Americans from Troy at the Constitution signing of that meeting. So they actually signed the Constitution to say this was going to be an organization that fought against slavery and asked for the immediate emancipation right, of slaves everywhere in the country. They come home back to Troy, and they start to organize around creating this auxiliary, and that creates a bigger network. One, in communication through these newspapers, but then two, in the letters and in traveling lecturers that are going to be part of the American Anti-Slavery Society circuit. Right? Here is, and I know this is such a mess, right? Because when you're trying to cut and copy and paste and move stuff around and print it from these newspapers, right, you try to make it as clear as you possibly can. Here is the Constitution, right, from this meeting of African Americans in Troy right, about how they're going to organize themselves and what the values of the community are. Right? One of the first things that they value right, is education. And the pursuit of education by African Americans in Troy had begun through the Sabbath school movement, and that was before 1810. So the small pocket, really, of free blacks in the city were already trying to access education for African Americans before freedom even occurred in the state. Okay? They then go on to find or sort of use in relationship with the First Presbyterian Church in Troy, which is the big building at Russell Sage College with the pillars, right? with a man named um, Nathan Beeman. He is a reverend. He's a spitfire. He becomes a radical abolitionist later on. And so they work with him and then some other local leaders to start an African-American school in Troy. So this starts, and they call it the Negro Schoolhouse, right, in 1833. They also use this Negro Schoolhouse, though, right, as a civic center. So there's non-denominational non religious instruction happening there. One of the men who's in charge of that is an African-American, and his name is Daniel Payne. Daniel Payne is originally from South Carolina, interestingly enough. He was born black. He had started educational things there for African-American children. He was run out of South Carolina because they're increasing and hardening in slavery. And he goes to Philadelphia, and he gets theological training in Gettysburg. He comes to Troy. He starts working in this non-denominational schoolhouse. right? Um, and in doing so, he also then starts to work with more of the free black community in Troy. Right? And so a lot of these written records and a lot of these things that go into the newspapers come from these highly literate African Americans, not only Daniel Payne, but then others in the city of Troy, and some people that move into Troy, what's constantly happening before the Civil War takes place. We have this major in-migration of what become very wealthy for black people at that time, right? African Americans in the city. And so one of the first movements in comes from New England, just like most of the white people who come to Troy end up coming from New England right after the American Revolution. That's when they identify the city. They change the name from Vander Heiden, the old Dutch family, right? Yes, they say it's too hard to write, too many letters and all these things. Um, and so they name it Troy because it's going to rise in this entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit. Right? Um, with this first migration in of white New Englanders, there are also African Americans. And one of the first was Samuel Baltimore. Right? He had fought in the American Revolution. He moves into Troy before 1810. That's when he first shows up on the city directory. Right? He then, his family sort of becomes this big dynasty in the city. He becomes a barber and a caterer. Um, his children you may be familiar with a little bit, Peter Baltimore. Right, the Rensselaer County Historic Society that's now the Hart Cluett Museum. They got a portrait a few years ago that was painted of Peter Baltimore returned to them. Um, and then also his other son, George Baltimore, becomes very involved in abolition. He, in 1840, will move to Whitehall up north. And it's kind of a link on the Underground Railroad for people of African descent who come through this area, that they have this additional spot um, up in Whitehall. And then, of course, Samuel's so grandson, Garnett Douglas Baltimore, who's named after Henry Highland Garnett and Frederick Douglass, right, will end up becoming the first black graduate of RPI. Right? So they're in Troy for many years. The other man that is critical to this period is William Rich. And William Rich had been born in Worcester, Massachusetts. 
He had lived in the home of the governor there and was kind of trained. Um, his family was free, but it was sort of like an apprenticeship kind of deal, it looks like. He soon moves to Boston, then comes via um, the entourage. He's an outrider for the uh, Marquis Lafayette when he makes his early tour after the American Revolution through this area, and he chooses to stay in Troy as well. And he becomes a barber too, and a very wealthy man. Right? Um, and then we see this migration in the 1830s immediately after the 1827 emancipation, where people from um, the Baltimore, Washington DC area make their way into the city. One of them is James Davis, and he becomes an assistant for General Wool the big general wool, and he will live in his home for different times. He will keep his account books for different times, so he becomes heavily involved in the churches and the abolitionist movement. Um, the other that comes in this way is a woman named Anne Lettison, and her birth was in the West Indies. She too will come to Troy, and she will live in General Wool's home too as sort of a domestic servant, we'll say. And I bring those people up just because, one, they end up being free people, right, who are then active in the community, but they're also connected to these other places, which in Troy becomes very critical for their abolitionist movement. The communication through newspapers allows people of different places to connect in a wider, faster way after the 1830s, and so all the activities that are happening here, people can read about in all these other locations, and it draws more people that are free to the city. But it also then helps when free people from, say, the Baltimore or Maryland area are in Troy, right? Because they may still have family members who are enslaved. And this helps link some of that Underground Railroad activity, right? And of course, when we mentioned Daniel Payne, he had come from South Carolina via the Pennsylvania, via Troy. And we know others later, or I know, others later come from South Carolina. And when it comes to the West Indies, there are two men that are very important. And Lettison came one time but also a man named Alexander Thuy. And Alexander Thuy and his brother came to Troy. They came as carpenters, and he becomes a very wealthy carpenter in this area. And the other one's name is Benjamin Bozeman. His son will end up becoming a doctor and be a black surgeon during the American Civil War. Right? And he was educated in Troy. So we have these Caribbean roots kind of too that's connecting Troy out to a larger global kind of network that was taking place. Right, so in 1833, before we have this issue of the American Anti-Slavery Society, people had already moved in Troy to establish the schoolhouse. Right? And you have these men in particular, but also women that are involved. Elizabeth Wicks becomes a teacher there, and she will soon work with Henry Highland Garnett, which many of us are familiar with. Henry Highland Garnett, the big radical abolitionist before the Civil War, in some ways the nemesis of Frederick Douglass, because he advocated at different times for violence to be used by the slaves to overthrow slavery. Okay? Um, Garnett was only in Troy for about a decade. Okay? And he comes in really at the end of the 1830s, the early 1840s. By the time he comes in, the facilities are already established, the community has already developed wealth, and they're already on this Underground Railroad network. So it's not that Garnett isn't fantastic for all these things, but one of the ways he became this major radical abolitionist was because of the support and the activity that the community gave him here in Troy, and they were already conducting. And then once he leaves in the end of the 1840s, they continue to do it, right? And so he's not the only person who made this community, though often when we read history books, they pretty much always say Henry Kylan Garnett founded the black community in Troy, right? It was more kind of the other way around. Right? So now, <clears throat> We also have to include in this that for this black community in Troy, they were connecting to wider networks. And one of the key things that was taking place before the Civil War is that African Americans in all of the free states were organizing national conventions, black national conventions for black civil rights and equality, and to discuss what was going on with slavery. Right? And in 1833, which is the third annual convention in Philadelphia, our friend William Rich, who has settled in Troy, who's got a lot of money, he goes and attends. So I like to put this up because it shows the minutes that they kept, what people were talking about, which has to do with the settlement in Canada at the time, right? and also the improvements that people are looking for in all the different states. Right? And William Rich was one of the attendants there in 1833. Right? He comes back to Troy, and that helps us understand even more because in 1833, that same year is when the American Anti-Slavery Society was founded. 
in Philadelphia too. So he comes back with all of this information and that helps create a bigger connection to a national movement against slavery. Right? Now, by the end of the 1830s, right, we see William Rich and the black community in Troy being recognized by the national community. Right? So they are talking about Rich and what Edward Bishop are doing in Troy. Edward Bishop had come to Troy from the Baltimore area in the 1830s. He ends up being um, kind of a lay Methodist minister, and then he will be the pastor for a good number of years in the Methodist black church in Troy. And what these two men do is create this um, interdenominational connection over fighting against slavery, right? but also organizing for suffrage and the right to vote, because they have to challenge that legislation that had been passed in the early 1820s before African American men were free. In Troy, around 1826, based on the $250 freehold, there were about six black men who qualified to vote, right? And so we have to remember too that before that, right, before this legislation had changed, being able to vote equally with other men who didn't have the money either, right, seemed okay because they were not then having a political voice to change policies and shape the nation, right, just like you weren't. But after that, if your interests are to see that human rights are, are extended and slavery ends, right, but the black population continues to grow with very little money and job discrimination in this policy, then it's even more difficult for you to practice citizenship right, in order to change this nation in any way, to influence policy. Right? And so really by 1837, William Rich and Edward Bishop have started to agitate the legislature. And you can see it here in this letter where they're saying that we will not give the legislature peace until they reconsider what we want when it comes to suffrage. Right? One of the big boosts that helps to extend this is done by a man named William Yates. And William Yates is African American. He comes to Troy in probably about the 1810s. There are some accounts that he was actually born here. They haven't fully been proven. Right? But he is here. He is within the African American community. He ends up becoming a member of the Lyceum group in Troy. He also is a lay minister. He's working in the Negro schoolhouse a little bit too, doing education. And what he does through these meetings is work with the other black leaders in the community, and they write what is considered the first legal treatise for male, equal male suffrage in the United States. Right? He issues it in 1838 out of Troy. Right? So we have this precursor right, to the demand for equal citizenship and equal rights and equal voting. Right. That's already being laid, the foundation is being laid in Troy before this major legal document has been written. Right. Now, this one on the side is dark and hard to see. But we must ask ourselves, you know, what facilities or where people are meeting to do all of this organizing. Right. And what we see is the first written record in the newspapers right, is that the first church in Troy that was founded was not Liberty Street Church. It was a Methodist church. Right? The black Methodists had moved out of the other white Methodist church, we'll say. Right? And in 1828, they founded a black Methodist den uh, denominational church. Now, in the next decade, it kind of splinters, and people don't like how people are practicing, and so they find another, you know, and then it becomes AME, AME Zion, over time. Right? But it's always led by an African American. And this facility is one of the facilities that's constantly used for all of the conventions and the meetings when people come into the city, in addition later to Liberty Street Presbyterian Church. Right? You also have here just a little snippet from Friedman's Journal, that first newspaper, and it shows that William Rich right, was one of the local agents receiving this paper in Troy. Right? So we have this news always coming in, and then the newspaper itself is circulating the community. This newspaper was also used for some time in the Negro schoolhouse. So if you didn't have books, you had this newspaper. Right? The other thing the newspaper was good for was just regular announcements. 
right? Because you gotta let people know what's going on. And it also connects people. And so you see here, William Rich, right, who ends up marrying Hannah Gideon. She becomes Hannah Rich, right? She is from Washington. Right? So where they met, not quite sure yet. Haven't found all those answers, right? But they marry and she settles in Troy as well. And she becomes heavily involved in the organization of, led by women in the city. Right? And then you have here right, a notice complimenting all these Trojans about what they're doing. And this is in 1837 as well. So this means that the larger right, free black community throughout the northern states, and particularly in New York City and down south, are aware Right, of what's going on in Troy. And they're complimenting them and they're noticing them and they're paying attention to them. And that really puts them on the map as some of the leaders in this movement for suffrage in the state of New York, but also at the forefront of this larger abolitionist movement that's taking place in the United States. Right. The key to establishing a lot of this leadership or the next generation comes from the education. Right? And so in 1833, when you have this Negro schoolhouse, right, you start to move your Sabbath schools into it. And you can see here William Yates. Right? He will work with the um, Sabbath school organizations in the city and be in charge of the Negro schoolhouse. Right? And so he is giving instruction. He says in the first year there are 80 pupils. It's pretty good. Right? He also says, of course, one of the problems for them is that they can't always attend school on a regular basis because of economic issues. Right? And then I like to put this up here so we have it, because the Negro Schoolhouse right, in 1838 will become Liberty Street Presbyterian Church. Right? So you have this as a picture much later of the Methodist Church. This here is Liberty Street Churches. So you have these two facilities that then do education, but then also have these religious practices, and at the same time are both locations used for meetings, conventions, and things like that. This is a picture of Daniel Payne, and then of course Henry Highland Garnett. Now the other thing in talking about these meetings that happen at these facilities is that we must remember they're also happening in people's homes. Because during this period in American history, most hotels were segregated. And so when convention goers or delegates, each community picked elected men and women, largely all men, to go to these conventions, when they got to different places, they had to look for a place that would accommodate them. And often there weren't massive hotels to do that or a large number of them. So they stayed or boarded with each other. And that's a key piece because that also adds to the wealth for some of the black women in Troy. Right? A few of them, like Peggy Williams, um, she will end up owning a boarding house. It is where Henry Highland Garnett later will live for a short period of time. And it's also where other people, as they're passing through the city or come to conventions that are held in Troy, will stay. Right? In 1840, right, after this treatise comes out two years earlier, the men in Troy, along with men in Albany and men in New York City, are going to call for the first African-American state convention to talk about the situation for civil rights for African-Americans in New York State, but also to organize to get the suffrage laws changed. And so I put up here right, what they issue afterward, which is a pamphlet. And then, of course, all these pamphlets they chop up and they issue in the newspapers. Right? So you can read what they were talking about. Troy has a huge delegation. Troy also right, is part of the planning and coordinating committee, so to find places for these events to happen and for people to stay where they're going to stay. Right? The women in Troy are going to prepare a huge spread, as they always do, and they get this big acclaim for being these great caterers to all of these conventions and feeding all of these men, but they do much more than that. Right? And in 1840, at this convention in the minutes, what they articulate is that they are um, of no, and it's a quote, foreign chime. Right? And that their nativity is being ignored. Right? And that there is a color complexion barrier on that political highway towards equality, but also participation as a citizen of the nation. Now, for this first meeting that takes place in Albany, people in Troy obviously travel there. 
right? And they take the ferries and other things across the river. And I like to put this up because the first president of one of the early organizations, which was called the African Female Benevolent Society, was founded by women, it seems to be biracial, Jane Lansing, you know, the Lansings in Lansingburg, for the, yeah, it was the year before she died, unfortunately, but in that year that they were founded, she becomes a member. She also, through there, donates um, supplies to the Negro schoolhouse. Right. And so they got some money and they got some oomph, right? There's also um, a Daughters of Williams organization that is founded. There's a uh, female organization out of the Methodist church that's also founded. And at times they fight with each other, but at other times they're completely united, right? Normal for every organization, right? After the 1840 convention, which these women attend, many of them, on the way back to Troy, the ship that they're going to ride on says they can't sit where they like to sit. They have to move to the colored section. And so these black Trojan women hold a sit-in. Yeah, they do, right? They hold a sit-in. They tell the ship's captain that if he is going to require them to move to different seats, which would be open on the promenade and in the weather and dealing with all that, then they're going to disembark and they won't go at all and they want their money back. And of course, he just walks away and they just sit where they want. Right? So they kind of win this sit-in, right? which really gives a testament, though, to the bravery and the tenacity right, of these black women in Troy while slavery is still being practiced in the South, and while really at this time politics are considered men's work. Right? So women are finding other ways in Troy to participate in civil rights and to organize around it. Right? Here is just a picture from the Troy Savings Bank. Right? records, and it has some of the black women in Troy who were putting money into the bank right, under the Female Benevolent Society's name, but also under their own. Right? So they're saving money, and a lot of this money is being contributed back into the abolitionist movement, but also for events, for boarding house things, right? for all of these organizations that are taking place. And then the major Convention, one of the first, in Troy happens in 1841. So now Troy is on the map as to holding statewide conventions that are bringing people in from all over the state. Right? And in this, right, they call out that the freehold of $250 as a personal tax violates them. And they continue to say this. They say that they need a self-political emancipation. Right? So they start borrowing the language, too from slaves, this emancipation. They need a political emancipation. Right? They then will become some of the leading figures in the statewide organization for suffrage. And that means collecting petitions, getting petitions signed. They set up a whole team of people to canvas Rensselaer County, go door to door, and have petitions signed asking for suffrage to be fixed, for the laws to change again. And you can see they gather them here in Troy. The headquarters for the gathering of petitions will be in Troy. Right? And they split later on almost like double duty with those people in Albany. And they hand deliver these petitions to the state legislature. They are so successful in this that they redesign the petition. Right? And you can see up here, right, assembled at Troy at the different time. In that, in 1846, the state legislature will agree right, to put forth the Negro suffrage um, referendum. So they put it before the public of the state to see if they'll approve it. And in Troy, it passes. Throughout the rest of the state, it does not. Okay. And then the meetings and these conventions for suffrage will continue to happen, political meetings in Troy. They will then span to other counties and other cities, again, continuing the petition drive, continuing the meetings. Right? The suffrage amendment will ultimately go before and pass the legislature to go to the public again in 1860. Right? Troy is home to four of these state conventions. Right? Albany is home to four. However, in all of those four, there's huge delegations from Troy that go, and Troy, again, is the coordinating committee for it all, which is very interesting, right? Um, sadly, in 1860, right, the election year of Lincoln, the suffrage referendum is rejected by the public. Right? 
And so what ultimately this means is that it will go before the public again after the Civil War in 1869. And New York State, again, refuses it. And so for African Americans in New York State, they do not receive equal suffrage until the same year with the 15th Amendment that slaves do. Right? So it tells you the tenacity of these men and women who are organizing these state conventions for suffrage to do it for almost 30 years, right? And then to gain momentum. Right? The other thing I want to throw up here before we begin to wrap up, right, is that not only did Troy hold these conventions before the Civil War, but during the Civil War, they often shift tactic a little bit. And because New York State had said that black men could not be in the state militia, which was one of the other ways that you could access the suffrage equally, during the Civil War, they become leaders in trying to organize black regiments for, this, for the Civil War and to recruit black men in this area. And so people from Troy will go down to Poughkeepsie for this meeting and they will hold it. They will commit themselves to recruiting soldiers and celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, saying that now right, men can fight for their citizenship in an equal way. And then they will issue a Bill of Rights in 1864 that attests to all of this again. And one of the biggest things that is a backdrop to all of this coming out of Troy goes back to those connections, right? Not only are you politically organizing within your state, but you have these bigger connections to communities outside of Troy and overseas. Right? And one of the local ways that people did that was to, sell, was to hold celebrations and commemoration days. So every time a different state or a different nation right, abolished slavery, they would begin to hold celebrations all around Juneteenth that day later on, right, in June. And in doing so, they invited people to Troy to be some of the presenters there. And this also create, creates a greater connection to outside communities, right? One of the first men who celebrates this in Troy is um, Nathaniel Paul. He had been from Boston. He ends up settling in Albany. He's a big, uh, preacher there, and Nathaniel Paul is very interesting because he also becomes the traveling agent for the Wilberforce community in Canada. Okay. That community, or, or um, the Upper Canada, Lower Canada, Dawn area, and places like that, was a black settlement that was founded by African Americans after a riot in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1829. And so he becomes a philanthropist for them, but also travels overseas to Britain, back to Albany, He's working with the men in Troy, so there's this constant connection there, also to Canada through this man and these celebrations about liberation. Right? The other one, of course, is that in 1839, with that movement of certain people from the West Indies, in Troy they will found a West Indian Mission Society for African Americans who want to go back to the West Indies or down to the West Indies to help the newly freed slaves there, which is super fascinating to think that you would, your religiosity would lead you to leave New York. I mean, not that America's so great, they got slavery and you can't vote, right? But, right, you're gonna embark on this dangerous trip, right, to the West Indies, not know what you're gonna totally find or experience there. And out of Troy, they find a West Indian <clears throat> society. One of the leading figures in this is that Alexander Thuy I had mentioned to you earlier. Right? He marries Jane Van Rensler, or Phoebe Van Rensler, excuse me, from Troy. She was born in Troy. The two of them, will become part of this West Indian mission, and they will go to the Nassau Bahamas, right? And that's where they will stay until 1847, when the two of them come back to New York to attend the Black National Convention, which will be held in Troy, right? And this is fascinating because it shows this kind of global traveling, right? But then also that there's this connection between Troy down into communities in the Caribbean already who are creating a global momentum to try to fight against slavery in the American South. And they also get help from James W. Pennington, who is actively going over to England and carrying letters from people in Troy saying that he is their representative to build this global movement against slavery in the American South. Now lastly, I'd like to end with, you know, you can fight for so long through conventions and writing letters and printing newspaper. You know, you can do all of that for so long. However, 
right? When a man that you help use the Underground Railroad leaves again for that Maryland area that you have so many in your community from and had been already starting in the 1830s, right? He ends up in your community and he is there working and his owner wants him back and sends a slave catcher up to get him. And the man finds him in Troy. He is arrested and right? he's grabbed, he's arrested. Um, you can only be peaceful for so long, right? And so in this sense, we sort of see that physical militance finally, where African-Americans then say, oh no, you're not gonna physically take someone. We are going to protect them. And who is in Troy at that time? Our good friend Harriet Tubman, right? Who actually had family in Troy. One of her first rescue missions was to help save her niece and her niece's children from slavery in the Baltimore area. And they relocated to Canada for a little bit. And then the niece and her husband, who had already been living in Troy, stay in Troy. So Tubman, Tubman had this kind of stopping ground when she was coming through. So she's visiting her cousin Keisha, or her niece, Keisha Boley, when Charles Nall, or Nally, as it's sometimes spelled, right, is arrested. And she helps the community or joins in with the community and what they had already organized, which was a vigilance committee to defend and look out for any kind of slaves who were moving through and were attacked or if kidnapping was taking place. And they take a stand, they rescue Charles now. They ultimately gather $600 to buy his freedom. And this is very telling because once, of course, they buy his freedom, he stays in Troy until after the Civil War and the 13th Amendment is passed. Not only that, this network that African Americans have developed in Troy helped get his family who had already been freed through Pennsylvania and up to Troy to join him until they ultimately returned down south after the Civil War to Washington, D.C. So Troy has a very long history in all of these different ways, right? Education, churches, protest, political organizing, not only for freedom for individuals, but for already free people for civil rights and suffrage rights. And so that is a little taste of the mammoth, right, dissertation that was 10 years in the making. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Do you find the contrast between the uh, progressive and effective black community of pre-civil and post-civil war with today's administration in Troy, where we have a fire department of 110 people, not one of whom as a person of color, is, do you feel the leadership of the black community is now affected in present Troy? Um, I would you know, so many things have changed um, since the end of the Civil War, but it didn't immediately become better. And so, you know, I mean, schools stay segregated in New York State until um, 1872, including in Troy. The Civil Rights Movement in Troy was um, not, of course, what took place in the South, but in a public sense, it was just as supportive. Um, and so I, I can't, 100% say that there's a direct connection. What I can say is that in looking at how this played out early after the Civil War, but also how it played out across the North, that there really was a systematic Jim Crow yeah. that took place in all the Northern states. And it's a new and growing kind of field of study um, in history right now. And between housing, between job hiring, between suburbanization and urban renewal, I could say that there may be a connection, but I don't have any solid proof, right? Thank but you could see something. Yeah. Would you describe the uh, Troy Police Department as a Jim Crow? <laughs> oh, you want to go right there, right? <laughs> Is the police department a Jim Crow department? Um, I don't know what the makeup of the, the police department today is, so I can't say you know, one way or the other. I will say um, that, you know, in the decades ago, Troy's police department was 
a little progressive. They hired women pretty early when other departments around the state were not. Um, so when it comes to just minority representation in that sense, they were a little ahead. Today, I don't know what the percentages are. And I also don't know how many people want to be a part, per se, or pers trying to pursue being police officers in the city of Troy. Why would they go to want to be a part? Of a Well, I mean, I would say some people want to join the police department who are minorities um, because they do want to make it better and more diverse, and they believe they have something to contribute to how the organizations themselves run, right? They can bring a voice on the inside. Um, and I will say, I don't think that all police departments are corrupt. I don't think that all police officers in any way hold um, universal racial bias. Okay? Um, I think that there's a hard position here in something that was never remedied from the civil rights movement was police brutality. I mean, it was going on before the civil rights movement. It was never addressed. Dr. King talked about it in 1963 in his speech about police brutality. Um, and it's across the country. So I can't say that there's straight bias. But I can say that you may not want, you may not feel as welcome if you're African American, right, into this police department if it's so, um, color-coded, maybe that's the way to say it. Um, but I do think some people are uninterested also in how it's run or how police departments work and perhaps don't have the means to be able to get into it, educationally, college, you know, police academies and things like that, to try to make a change. So I don't really know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes? Sure. If on the map of Troy, the early map, you could tell us, point out where was that schoolhouse. <clears throat> That's fascinating. I didn't know about mm -hmm. that. The schoolhouse, let's see, was originally the old building for the First Presbyterian Church. It was a meeting house. It was over by, let's see, <clears throat> where Ferry Street is trying to get my, sorry, I think I'm starting to need glasses, and I don't want to admit it all the way. Um, so down here, I believe. It's still standing. The, no, it's not. It ended up being moved from that location over to where Liberty Street Church is, or was, right? And so, like, down by, on Liberty Street, there's a sign there, because the church had burned down a couple of times, and then later, it's wiped out for urban renewal. So um, that's where it ends up being moved to, and then it becomes the church, and there's a historic marker there today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your reflection on when you were a fifth grader and when you felt like you just were not connected with history. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if after you completed your you know many years of research, what what of the stories, you know, are there one or two that that you have discovered that you wish you could have which ones might you have connected with, do you think, as a fifth grader back some time ago? <clears throat> Um, I think it probably would have been, there's a couple. One would have been the black women in Troy and the organizations they, they established um, and the sit-in, right? That they go to this meeting, they're sitting in on these political meetings when women don't have the right to vote and Susan B. Anthony and others are coming through Albany too to try to get the right to vote. And these women prioritized the racial concern over the, the gender concern at the time. But then to be brazen enough, right, to... Um, not only have these organizations, but then to say, we're not moving, we're, we're not going to switch our seats no matter what you say to us, we'll leave and we'll take our money. Um, that would have struck me as something to show um, not only the tenacity of women, but that the women in the city themselves, right, were in many ways educated. They were running businesses. They had the ability to be able to kind of demand that and one, so I think that was really one of the major ones. Um, the other one was, that stuck with me a lot was prior to the Charles Now um, rescue, there is an earlier slave rendition case, and that happens at the end of the 1830s, and that's a man named Louis Antonio, 
and he too had come from the uh, from Brazil actually. He comes as a well, it's kind of confusing. Okay, the man who brings him is Robert Yates, unrelated to William Yates, and Robert Yates is from Albany and from a wealthy family, and he becomes this businessman and um, like a consul for Brazil, for America in Brazil. And he comes back after he marries, he goes down there to business, he comes back and he brings Luis Antonio with him and he claims he's an indentured servant. But then at other times he says he bought him, and this is all happening in the early 1830s. By that point when he comes into America, it's illegal. He can't bring a slave with him because 1808 had eliminated the importation of new slaves. So it was kind of convoluted. But he gets in Albany and he says to him, hire yourself out and find something to do with yourself. So um, Louis Antonio comes to Troy and he works with this man whose last name is Turner. And then Yates wants him back and he files the paperwork and they arrest you know, um, Antonio. And there's this whole court thing that plays out, right? The people in Troy and there's vigilance committee get, um, it looks like Martin Townsend to represent him. Um, and then when it comes to the time for court, Yates never shows up. So you're kind of like, the, 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 it might be up, right? It might be a lie. Because otherwise, all you had to do was walk in with your paperwork to say, here, right, here it is. Um, and then so Louis Antonio is then free. And at the same time, Yates had charged Turner with harboring his fugitive. And so Turner himself then had to be tried too. And he gives this whole spiel about the um, 1808 federal legislation that says something's wrong here because he can't bring this person in. And he goes into this like kind of rendition about it. And it was fascinating. And, and for me, thinking about it, when I was that young to know that there were people paying attention and who could argue some constitutionality in Troy that were African American, whether they could like read or write or not, and they were defending each other in this way, it would have made a big difference. Yeah. yeah. I had heard about Harriet Pittman being present uh, with Charles Nolley. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, effort. Um, I'd also heard that Frederick Douglass attended some of the uh, those uh, co uh, colored people's conferences mm -hmm. in the 1840s, mm -hmm. or 1847. I wonder if you uh, could verify that. Oh, he absolutely does. Right on these logs, I will show you. It's kind of hard to see some of them, but. Um, this one's in New York, or in Philadelphia in 1833. And you get some of the early heavy hitters, like the Purvises. They were a wealthy family um, in Philadelphia. They were related to James Fortin, who was the sailmaker, the free black man who had a lot of money. So you see all of them kind of here. Here's Robert Purvis, <clears throat> right? Um, you see William Jenkins. You end up later with um, William Watkins, too, who's just as powerful, but in a different way as Douglas. He's from the Baltimore area. He ends up working with Douglas in Rochester on Douglas's newspaper. Um, he's at these uh, conventions. You also get the big teams from New York City, Charles B. Ray, who becomes a journalist for the Colored American. He comes to Troy a number of times. He's um, at them. You get Frederick Douglass, you get James McCune Smith. At many of them, he was the African American first, they say the first doctor. He couldn't get into a school in America, so he goes to England, Glasgow, and he gets his um, education there, and then he comes back. He's at these conventions. They do descend into Troy. Um, and a lot of the local meetings, too, in the papers, it will say, you know, Douglas said this about, you know, trying to vote this way. Um, Rich countered him in this way. And then, of course, there's always Garnett and Douglas hate each other. Well, they don't say that, but they're just like, these two are just banging heads. Um, and then Stephen Myers, too, who tended to be closer, I think, with Frederick Douglas than some other people did. Because in Troy, they, they were not, um, they were more unanimous in their organizing at these conventions. And they were not as divided as like in New York City. Some of the major leaders stayed with sort of the Garrisonian camp, which meant you didn't get involved in politics. And I think one of, one of the reasons they did that was because in Massachusetts, African-American men could vote, right? So they don't have to spend the same time on this other civil right issue. Whereas in New York, if you can't vote, you're going to spend some of your time doing this. And Frederick Douglass ends up being in New York, but he's a Garrisonian for a long time, too. So there's rivals there. Um, and then later, Garrison and Douglass split, really in the early 1850s. And Douglass, Garnett, uh, McCune-Smith, William Watkins, they go for the Liberty Party. 
um, with Garrett Smith, who offers a ton of land, and a number of Trojans or people who embarked on some of that land and then came back to Troy. Um, they also then go towards the Republican Party, but they make it at these conventions. They say very clearly, we do not support everything about the Republicans. We just believe that they're a better choice than the Democrats, right? Um, and oddly enough, I found this one article, and I'm still digging into it, talking about Martin Van Buren, that one of his father's slaves was named um, Harvey Martin, and they affectionately called him Uncle Harry. So he would row, he says he would row uh, Mrs. Van Buren up the river to meet with Mrs. Vander Heiden. Um, and then he gains his freedom around 1827. He ends up voting um, and saying this in the newspaper in every election he possibly can, which means that he obviously had the money to be able to qualify to do so. And he votes um, a Democrat all the way up to the Civil War, and is proud of it. And they make note of it, like, nope, he is gonna be loyal to Van Buren and these Democrats and all these, other. it's crazy, right? Um, but yeah, and so, you know, he was one of the early founders for the Negro Schoolhouse. Theodore Sedgwick is at these meetings. His father lived in Schenectady. Theodore Sedgwick comes to Troy a lot. He was at the conventions. Um, his father was at the conventions. Garnett was there, Douglas. I mean, this is where they all convene together. And so that's why it's so powerful in 1847. Not only are all of them there, but then you get these other global travelers that they're connected to with the Thuis who come back and Pennington who's going to England and coming back and they're all descending on Troy because you know, they are gonna put out these petitions and they're gonna keep at, just agitating for civil rights, regardless of who agrees with them or not, right? Frederick Douglass, oh well, good for you, but this is what we're doing here, we're gonna keep doing it, you know? You're welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of them worked on the wharfs and the docks, that was one. Um, and this is, I'm just giving sort of the, the by economics. Um, some of them are whitewashers, right? So they maintain paint buildings and things like that. Um, you have some, there's a few that are Teamsters, one of which is um, Thomas Jefferson. He is the Teamster that helps J um, John Brown move to North Elba. He's in Troy, and he ends up getting a plot there for a while and coming back and forth. Um, his brother Samuel, too, they're both from, or kind of a relation, they're both from Virginia. Um, they are also barbers, which is the wealthiest section. Caterers, Anthony Schuyler may be connected to the Schuyler family descendants there. He was a caterer. Um, they are also, like in the case of Benjamin Bozeman, whose son goes on to be in the Civil War, he works on ships, and being stewards on ships brought in quite a bit of money, so there were a number of them. And a few of the men who I found in um, Baltimore that were working on ships also ultimately settle in Troy, and they work on ships some more, too. Um, one of them is Lloyd Harper, interesting. He becomes a janitor at RPI. Um, and they call him a very prestigious citizen later on and things like that. Then he becomes like private security for someone. It's pretty fascinating. Um, but so those are largely the jobs for them. For women, they are seamstresses. Oh, oh, and the leather job for men was coachmen, driving the coaches, right, of famous men like Yuri Gilbert in the Charles Now situation, he was hired as a coachman. Um, the Latour family is another black family who did that. Um, for women, it's seamstresses. Um, they are also sort of domestics or servants, so they're working in different homes. Um, they, it is, I don't wanna say rumored, but I have found a few lines here and there that a couple of black women were in the mills, but I haven't found it, I haven't been able to prove it solidly. So I think they might have just been like dark-skinned immigrants versus you know um, African-Americans. Some of them um, are also in the food industry. So one woman named Mrs. Cooper has this refinery with ice cream and things like that that is advertised, like you're coming to the convention, stay with the boarding house owners, but then also get ice cream over here at Mrs. Cooper's. Um, and that's largely, and, and school teachers. Oh yeah, they, they don't end up in the foundries until, um, I think it's the latter part of the 1860s. I did find one note that there was one earlier, but again, not being able to confirm that. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, where did some of these local leaders, where were they buried? Um, many of them are buried in Mount Ida Cemetery. 
up in Troy. Are they commemorated with um... Um, Some of them are, some of them are not. This, some of them that are Civil War soldiers, they have notes that say. They're typically the sons of these men that I'm talking about. Some of them have um, markers on their headstones. Uh, William Rich is up there, his wife is up there. The, uh, some of the Bozemans are up there. Um, the Baltimore family is in Oakwood. Um, Alexander Thuy and Jane Van Rensselaer have a gigantic grave marker down in the Bahamas. It's gigantic. And I don't know, I haven't been able to figure out yet if they paid for it then or if people paid for it later, right? Because two different possibilities here that mean different things. Um, but a lot of the, the ones in Troy are, are buried up in, in Mount Ida, the majority of them. Mm -hmm. yep. Any other questions? Well, excellent. Thank you for coming. Right. For listening to me babble. <laughs>